are great country houses, the most familiar and yet intriguing sights Britain has to offer, standing like sentinels in the landscape. Hundreds of thousands of us visit them every year, but not all are open to the public. I've been granted the privileged opportunity to pass through the portals of six of our greatest country houses, normally hidden from public view. They've seen five centuries of British history, up close and personal. The families who built these houses played their part in great affairs of state. Central to their dreams, the Great House, the ultimate status symbol, but all too often also the ultimate money drainer. Few of these families went the distance, but their houses did, with their secrets intact. This is their story, but it's also our story, for these houses offer a guided tour of our nation's hidden history. I'm on my way to explore one of the most fascinating country estates in Northern Ireland. And I can get there from here, from Belfast, by train. The estate, secluded deep in the farmlands and woodlands of County Down, is called Clanderboy. And rather conveniently, a railway station was constructed within its grounds. Ah, oh, here it is, Helen's Bay. Indeed, very convenient. The station was built in 1863 by the family living at Clanderboy, the Dufferins. Up there are the family's initials, together with a coronet. The station is a charming ornamental Gothic structure. And it contained not only the booking office, but also a private waiting room for the Dufferins, with a staircase leading down to a private avenue. Waiting in the avenue would be a horse-drawn carriage ready to transport the family to Clanderboy House. The carriage would pass below this wonderful bridge, a sensational thing, which to me looks rather like a medieval city gate. Fantastic portal to a hidden world. This portal takes me to the past in more ways than one. Ah, oh, here it is, Clanderboy, a very handsome late Georgian country house. It's one I've known for well over 30 years. I've spent some most astonishing times here. Indeed, this walk for me is very much a journey back in time. Clanderboy has belonged to the same family for 400 years. Today, the Marchioness of Dufferin and Arva lives here. Born into the Irish aristocratic family, the Guinnesses, she moved here in 1964 when she married Sheridan, the fifth Marquess, who died over 20 years ago. Lady Dufferin also happens to be a very old friend of mine. Yes, please. I'd love to give you a second. It's so wonderful that you're back. Back here. At it's, it's wonderful to be back. Oh. Fantastic, actually. Now, I tell you what, I don't think you can resist a sandwich. Can I know, you? I can't resist a sandwich. I'm, 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 I'm very lovely. Be we are. Beautifully pre presented. It's yes. a tradition. Yes, I'll take that one. Actually, very often I make people eat two at a time. I can't remember exactly when I first visited Clanderboy. It was so long ago. But Lindy may have solved the mystery. I've got this treat because we can oh, now yes. find out when you first came here. Yes, all so right. So here we go. <laughs> so this is the guest um, book, OK. Now, I put our specs on, so here we go. Now, I put Clown a little... Boys. Well, 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 what's the first one? What's the first date here? Um, 1931. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. Ulster Aces. And <laughs> who, who was here? Evelyn War. Look, that's interesting. Evelyn War, yeah. yes. 
Actually, he was a great friend of the family, so I think he came here quite often. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's, let's leap forward a bit to, I suppose... Well, it's fine, when, you, when did you first come to the house? I can hardly well, remember. Oh, we think 1961. 61? Lindy there. Guinness, you're here. Yes, you That's see, but I think 63. I came. Hooli for Sheridan Here we are again. Lindy. Look, oh, look. David Bailey and you. Oh, and he was divine. Now, where do we go? I'm going to find you. Dan Cruikshank. But that's weird. Gotcha. That's my name. It's not my signature. I wasn't I here. I bet it is. You were drunk. I wasn't here. This is weird. You were drunk when you read well, it. Well, mostly drunk. I could, must be. Look, where, where, Christmas where, 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 1975. That's that. Gotcha. That's, that's, that's more like it. Now, that's, that's how long ago. 75, 85, 95, 105. <laughs> Do you realise that's 35 Yes. 35 years ago. Ago. That's a sobering thought. And I must say, you look wonderful on it, don't <laughs> I be saying so? It's the whiskey. And You're just as handsome. Well, perhaps it's my no, eyes that are dulling. <laughs> I see you through they, sort of a yeah, mist. Yeah, through, through rosy, they, they, rosy, yes. rosy mist. They were wonderful times. Candleboy, under Lindy and Sheridan, became a magnet for artists and writers. It was a bohemian scene that would surely have startled Sheridan's ancestors. The sober and very sensible Blackwoods. They were Scots Protestants who originally came to County Down in the early 17th century and rose to become minor gentry. They marked this ascent with a massive expansion of their house in 1801 by a little known architect, Robert Woodgate. I'm now in the path of the house built just after 1800. Very elegant but somewhat conventional late Georgian architecture. Oh, here are the Blackwoods. And I must say, these uh, portraits reveal them to be a somewhat serious bunch, not, I should think, given to flight of fancy. In fact, one of the Blackwoods admitted they had no interest in art and literature, and even that they regarded imagination as a mental disease. Given their lack of imagination, the Blackwoods would surely have been horrified by what was about to happen to their house. They remain in a part of Canterboy that's largely untouched, but elsewhere, that's very definitely not the case. This house was radically transformed when the front door was moved to the rear. And this is where the magic of Canterboy begins. I've explored many country houses over the years, but I must say, the main entrance to Canterboy is still the strangest I've ever seen. It's so understated. Just a low, long, blank wall, and then a very plain door. But the moment you step inside, it all starts to make sense. Open the door to a breaking the seal on an Egyptian tomb. This is high architectural theater everywhere. Wonderful and revealing objects. Look at this pair of Bears, baby bears, killed and stuffed. And in here, Indian weapons and armor, Burmese celestial figures, all telling a tale about the house, the man that made it. Utterly incredible. If a tropical bird flew past now, I wouldn't be surprised. This is the world of Frederick Lord Dufferin, one of the greatest diplomats of his age, Viceroy of India and friend of Queen Victoria. This house is an embodiment of his achievements, but is also a melancholic monument to the declining fortunes of his class, the Victorian aristocracy. Lord Dufferin transformed Clanderboy into a fairy tale. The house is a journey through his life, through his age, through the imperial adventure. There are wonderful objects everywhere which unite to tell the story of one exceptional man. This exceptional man was always destined to be different from his staid ancestors. In 1825, his father Price, the fourth Lord Dufferin, shocked the rest of the Blackwoods by marrying the granddaughter of the celebrated Irish playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan. 
Helen Sheridan was artistic and an accomplished society beauty. Her world was a fashionable London beau monde. She was everything the Blackwoods were not. Oh. A year after her marriage to Price Blackwood, Helen gave birth to their only child, a son, Frederick. And here is a lovely little portrait of a young chap, aged four or five, painted by Helen. Very wonderfully done. And um, behind it is a lock of hair, Frederick's hair, blonde, when he was one year old. This hair was cut by Helen. Um, the centre price in the Royal Navy, away from home a lot. It's a little reminder of his infant child. And the hair and portrait were later united to create this very intimate, very wonderful thing. Helen's ambitions for her son were always high. As was usual at the time, she looked across the Irish Sea to England for his future. She wanted him to be groomed for high public office to make the right contacts. And there was nowhere better to do that than at Eton, the finishing school of choice for the aristocratic elite. In 1839, when Frederick first arrived, Eton had already produced an astonishing 10 prime ministers and had even won the Battle of Waterloo on its playing fields, according to old boy, the Duke of Wellington. Here, at the heart of the British power network, Helen hoped her son would achieve greatness himself. Dr Andrew Gailey, Vice Provost of Eton, is writing a biography of Lord Dufferin. Like his subject, Andrew comes from Ireland. Eden, I suppose, was the obvious place to, to send Frederick. Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, if you've got a, ambitions to make something great in England, and uh, not necessarily in Ireland at the time. Um, in fact, most boys would just probably gone locally. Um, but if you have ambitions for to acquire, as they say, a bit of the polish, and certainly provincial Blackwoods were quite interested in acquiring a bit of the polish, then uh, Eton was the place to go. To make connections, of course, if that's, that's yes. the thing, isn't it? To move into the, the big world. To make the connections, to, uh, m to learn about a world that you're going to have to operate in. And if you wanted to be up with that and in that social world, then you had to be Englishified. So his background when he arrived at Eton, would he have had a very provincial atmosphere about him? His father describes him as being all hunched up in his early days at Eton. And he was probably a bit bullied too. And then it all comes good. He's managed to use his Irishness to effect. Yeah, and he was good at, at speaking, you know, an orator. He, he, he obviously you know, had some distinction. But very much, and he would be the one that, uh, whenever the house was having a great feast or a great celebration, they would call on the little orator, as they called him, uh, to go and declaim. And it you know, f became an art form for the rest of his life, and, and indeed, probably one of his greatest strengths. His mother's little orator was now in the charmed inner circle of Eden life, forming close friendships with the men who would run Britain and her empire. The British aristocracy was at the zenith of its power, owning over half the land in Britain and nothing symbolised their grip on the nation more than the great country house. Places like Hatfield House, owned by the family of Frederick's Eton friend, Lord Robert Cecil, and Kimberley Hall, the home of his classmate John Woodhouse, the future Lord Kimberley. At Eton, Frederick must have fully grasped the notion that behind every great man, lay a great estate. And he was to have his own estate sooner than anyone imagined. One evening, 
at the end of term, Frederick was on the bridge that stood here and suddenly turned to a friend